think the UN would uh, do itself a great favor if instead of the automatic Israel bashing, they actually turned their attention and their investigative committees against these terrorists to trample every norm uh, on which the UN was founded. It helps that Israel, the United States, uh, and the other civilized countries stand together against this uh, grave threat. Let me just add that you are our friend, as we are your friend. And we will stand together. We come together in support with our friends, our only true friend in the Middle East, and that's Israel. That was Democratic Congressman Gregory Meeks of New York on a congressional visit to Jerusalem in 2014, reassuring Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that the U.S. had Israel's back after dozens of US, U.N. peacekeepers in the Golan Heights were abducted by an al-Qaeda-linked group out of Syria. Because the U.S. has always had Israel's back. Democrat, Republican, it hasn't mattered. Until, maybe, now. Yesterday, we learned that the Biden administration had approved a $753 million arms sale just before violence flared up in Israel and Gaza. And even Gregory Meeks, the very pro-Israeli head of the powerful House Foreign Affairs Committee, tried to delay the deal. Emphasis on tried. That was the report last night. But by this afternoon, Congressman Meeks was backtracking and seemingly appeased by a briefing from the White House. But the fact remains that normally staunch pro-Israel Democrats are pushing back against Israel's aggression for what seems to be the first time I can remember in my lifetime. Senator Robert Menendez of New Jersey, chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, criticized the Israeli airstrikes that destroyed the Gaza offices of the Associated Press and Al Jazeera over the weekend. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and 28 more Senate Democrats are calling for an immediate ceasefire. Schumer the guy who spoke before the annual gathering of the pro-Israel lobby, AIPAC, and said that the Bible gave Israel the right to the land. Of course it's our land, he told the conference in 2018. The Torah says it. None of these Democrats have changed their stances in a vacuum. They're not being pushed just by activists, but by left-wing members of their own caucus, who have grown in number and seem to know how to wield their power. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who called Israel an apartheid state. Jamal Bowman, who won his seat by beating pro-Israel hawk Elliot Engel. And this weekend, gently reprimanded a fellow New York City congressman for supporting Israel. And Rashida Tlaib, the first Palestinian-American woman to serve in Congress, who today, in a meeting with the president, told Joe Biden that Palestinian human rights are not a bargaining chip and must be protected, not negotiated. This represents a sea change in the Democratic Party. Because the reality is that most elected members of the Democratic Party who say they are liberals, progressives, supporters of principles such as freedom, self-determination, dignity, human rights, have for far too long refused to apply those principles in the occupied Palestinian territories. They recite talking points about their support for a two-state solution and the need for a peace process, but say very little about the rights or even humanity of the Palestinian people. Critics on the left even have a term for it, PEP, progressive except Palestine. Progressive when it comes to standing up for marginalized minorities at home or persecuted groups abroad in China or Syria or Sudan, but not in Israel or the occupied Palestinian territories. The truth is that when it comes to racial discrimination, the detention of children, police brutality, the denial of voting rights, Jim Crow laws, here in the United States, Elected Democrats are rightly up in arms, outraged, outspoken. But when such things, or worse, happen in the occupied territories, or even inside of Israel, when they happen to Palestinians, too many elected Democrats have tended to, at best, turn a blind eye, and at worst, defend it, excuse it, and of course, fund it. What makes this current moment so stark then, so unprecedented, so historic perhaps, is that attitudes towards Israel and the Palestinians are clearly changing within the Democratic Party and among liberal Americans in general. For more on this, let's bring in Congressman Mark Pocan, Democrat of Wisconsin. He's chair emeritus of the Progressive Caucus. Uh, Congressman, thanks for coming back on the show. You yourself have been pretty critical of Israel in recent days. Why is that message, that narrative, less pro-Israeli than usual, more pro-Palestinian than we've seen before, resonating with so many members of your caucus right now? What's changed inside your party to make this moment so different? I think elected officials are catching up with where the people across the country are because 
uh, outside of places like state capitals in Washington, D.C., uh, people who are watching what's happening are seeing uh, buildings destroyed, children being killed, uh, media outlets being bombed, roads to hospitals being bombed, people being attacked in mass, uh, housing being taken away from people. Uh, and those aren't at all within the value set that we have as Americans. And I think that finally more elected officials, those in Congress, are speaking out on behalf of our constituents saying that human rights uh, means everyone. And if you have a friend, and Israel is a friend of the United States, is getting in the car drunk and uh, keeps hitting people, someone's got to say something to your friend. And it's time now for Israel to stop the bombings. We need an immediate ceasefire. And we need to have humanitarian conditions. We need to have the Palestinians treated with respect and dignity, or we're never going to have peace in this region. Indeed, and a lot more Democrats are saying that. And yet, Speaker Pelosi today, in calling for a ceasefire, did place blame for bloodshed squarely on Hamas. Why are so many in the Democratic Party still unwilling to recognize both the human rights of the Palestinian people, which they advocate for in other countries, in China or Syria or Venezuela for the people, and also the actions of the Israeli military, which caused most of the bloodshed that we've seen this far? You know, I, I think people just have to look beyond the last nine or 10 days. What most people uh, hear about is there were rockets fired from Hamas uh, and then a return fire from Israel. But what didn't get mentioned before that was the attack at a mosque during the holy holiday of Ramadan or the people in East Jerusalem being pushed out of their homes because of uh, illegal settlement expansions by the Israelis. And they don't know that it's not just been the last 10 days, but it's been uh, months, years, decades of these abuses that's happened. And if you really look at it with open eyes, you can only really see uh, a situation that reminds us all too often of a former South Africa. You know, last time I was there, I remember looking in a valley and there's a road with a giant wall down the middle. And on one side of the road, Israelis drove and one side, Palestinians drove. That's exactly out of a former South Africa. And I think uh, people are, are, are seeing what's happening and saying that we need to stand up and, and say something different than what I think we've said for too long. And many of the newer members of Congress, especially, are the ones who are speaking out the most. So you're right about that, Congressman. Historically, though, it's been the White House, with the exception of perhaps Donald Trump, that has tried to lead on the Israel-Palestine issue, that has, you know, in times of conflict, made the calls and suggested at the margins maybe Israel should maybe restrain itself. And it's been Congress that has resisted any pressure uh, on Israel. Yet the opposite seems to be happening right now, including, it appears, with the Democratic chairs of the Senate and House Foreign Relations Affairs Committees. I mean, Democrats in the House and Senate were calling for a ceasefire at the weekend, and yet the president, the leader of your party, who has had what sources tell NBC News is a pretty tense phone call with Benjamin Netanyahu, more tense than previous calls, even now still refuses to publicly call for a ceasefire, despite hundreds dead. Joe Biden has not called for a ceasefire in public. And it's completely unacceptable that uh, Netanyahu will not agree to a ceasefire. So we're doing a letter right now in the House that 10 of us, a very diverse group of members, are circulating. And I think you're going to have a lot of people oh, signing hold on, a letter. Congressman. Hold on, Congressman, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in. I'm going to jump in. You said it's unacceptable that Netanyahu doesn't agree to ceasefire. Agreed. But I asked you about Joe Biden. Is it unacceptable that, that, that Joe Biden hasn't called for a ceasefire? Yes. Uh, he needs to demand a ceasefire. And that's what we're seeing right now is you're going to have a bunch of congressional members asking for that tomorrow, saying we absolutely have to have a ceasefire. And there's more of us who are starting to question this most recent sale of military weapons. You know, I have supported the Iron Dome in that the idea was it de-escalates tensions. If a rocket comes over, rather than sending a bunch of rockets in and killing people and destroying buildings, you take the rocket out. But if instead you take the rocket out and then you still kill 20 times more people than were killed in Israel, uh, that's not living up to what I think many of us intended with the assistance that we're providing. So, you know, we're starting to question uh, these additional um, sales of military equipment. We wanna make sure that people aren't gonna be um, having this might that Israel has, killing too many people on the other side with human rights abuses. And I, I just think that there's really a change. You know, we've been doing the same thing over and over again. And here we are back to having hundreds of people, including uh, dozens of yes. children killed in Palestine. And now we need Joe Biden 
to demand something of Israel because a lot of our assistance is helping to protect, rightfully so, people in both Israel and Palestine. At the end of the day, I think the real issue is the only people who benefit from what's going on right now are Benjamin Netanyahu and Hamas, and it's the people in Palestine and Israel and uh, our country, ultimately, that are the, lo the, the losers on this deal. Yes. Benjamin Netanyahu, Hamas, and people who sell weapons for a living are doing very well uh, out of conflicts like this. Let me ask you this, Congressman. We just put up some polling on screen uh, of how three out of four Americans would rather the United States government doesn't take a side in this conflict, leans towards neither side. We know, of course, the United States government is very pro-Israeli, does fund Israel's military, does protect Israel at the UN. I just wonder, you said at the start that members of Congress are catching up with the people. That's what the polling suggests. And yet, we look at two countries in the Middle East. When it comes to Saudi Arabia, both the public has shifted and the politicians have shifted in terms of a more critical stance on Saudi Arabia, the war in Yemen. When it comes to Israel, though, that shift still, I mean, we're talking about some of the shift tonight, but still overwhelmingly there is a sense that Congress will back Israel, the White House will back Israel, even as hundreds of Palestinians are killed. Why are the double standards when it comes to, say, the war in Yemen versus the war in Gaza? Israel has been a longtime ally of the United States. And if, even when I got in Congress eight and a half years ago, uh, I heard from many people in my district uh, that they wanted to make sure we were there to completely support Israel. But people are watching the, the human rights abuses, uh, the killings, the, the mistreatment of Palestinians that, again, looks like an apartheid state all too often. And because of that, what we're hearing now is a very different view. In fact, the Jewish community, largely in my district, is very appreciative of what we're doing because they want peace in the region and they want people treated with respect and dignity, whether you're Israeli or Palestinian. So I, I really do think that what we're hearing from our constituents is that they want us to uh, bring peace in this region. The way you do it is by having a ceasefire. Uh, and it's not just supporting one side over the other. So um, that may be the polling in general, because I think in general, most Americans don't follow a lot of uh, foreign affairs issues. But I can tell you the shift that I and others have seen from our constituents is definitely uh, on the side of trying to bring about a more balanced approach to the Middle East.